la verdad es pues, desapro... desaprevenido hace rato que te pregunté. Pero ahora sí ya lo, ya lo tengo. Nelson, unidad 4. Okay, so it's kind of clearly visible what this is, a Siltronics 1011D. Uh, one of my favorite um, <laughs> early black box radios. <laughs> I guess that's the easiest way to say it, because that's pretty much what it is. Um, done videos on these before. My old radios are, uh, now it's not 100% tube type, but the majority of it is. Uh, honestly, a lot of your tube type equipment will frequently have you know for decades you know diodes were around for a long time and as soon as the price came down on semiconductors you know even in the early days uh, they stopped using diode tubes and a lot of times you'll find radios that won't have a, a rectifier tube in it because they're using solid state diodes and then as other semiconductors became you know got invented and became cheaper they started to use them so you know this kind of falls into that category because this actually has some transistors in the VFO circuit, but for the most part, the, still the majority of the radio is tube type operation. Really good radios, built like a tank. Uh, these things will, you know, it's kind of like the, what, the Energizer Bunny or whatever the heck it is, you know, takes a licking and keeps on ticking, or no, Timex, not, not the Energizer Bunny. Timex, yeah, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. That's what the Siltronics 1011s are. Uh, now this is the D version, so the last model or the last version of them. Um, as you can hear, this one's receiving fine. Uh, now, the customer has not actually had this in his hands yet. Uh, he's an amateur radio operator, and he bought this off of another amateur radio operator. Found it, I think, on QTH. Um, now, that person said that they had uh, modified this for strictly 10-meter use. Because, honestly, these radios are kind of yeah, so-so useless <laughs> for a good bit on 10 meters nowadays because of where the, the 10 meter band actually is on these it's from you know, out of the box these things covered from obviously you can see the CB band you know, it says 27 megahertz but yeah it covers from a little bit below 26 uh, 95 you know, it gets down to like especially if you get the dial off because these will these things will tune off the scale but uh, yeah, probably like 26.7, 26.8, up to about 26.5. Um, trying to think, because you can usually get 5, 5, 5, I think, when you have it up at the top end of the scale. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, anyhow, so the CB band on this one had been modified. So it would cover, actually, where is my note? Let me grab my notepad here. Uh, when I first turned this on, the CB band was in the 28 to 28.5 megahertz range. So he basically had it set up for full 10 meter, you know, the 28 megahertz range. So from 28 megahertz to 29 megahertz. Um, and actually heard some traffic on, uh, on there when I first turned it on. Now the customer wants this one put back to basically as it would have left the factory. So back to stock configuration stock frequency range on these. Now luckily the person that did did that frequency modification knew what they were doing. <laughs> 
And it's not so much that they knew what they were doing, but they picked the proper method of doing it. There are several ways to modify the frequency range or the the frequencies for these bands on here. The problem is a lot of people do it the wrong way, and the wrong way is is chained fiddling with the inductors inside the VFO can here. Actually, I don't even have that screwed back down yet. And the channels are going to change as I slide this thing off because that greatly affects the, VC, the VFO. But uh, so if there's a big wire uh, inductor here wrapped around a ceramic coil form, and then there's also if I get the camera back far enough, you can just see it. There's another coil right down in here. Okay. The problem I've seen on a lot of these things is when people modify them, they screw with these two coils. They will either rewind this one for a longer coil, or they'll clip it and you know, shorten the windings, or they'll modify this coil right here. Honestly, that's just not the right way to do it. <laughs> if you want to change the frequency, like the person did with this one, what they did was they changed the capacitors right here. So these are parallel capacitance. So you have a trimmer capacitor here. Now, yes, this is an air variable style capacitor, but it's still a trimmer capacitor because it's PCB mount. But these capacitors are in parallel with these sets of ceramic capacitors right here. So these are in parallel with this trimmer cap, and these are in parallel with these this trimmer cap. And remember, the capacitance in parallel adds. So... What they what that person did, I don't even know if it's a he or a she, but whoever it was, what they did was is they changed the values of these capacitors to come up with the right total capacitance to shift this frequency to get it into the like I say, it covered from twenty eight to twenty eight five. And actually the two caps that were in there are these two that I took out. So all now the problem is now I've worked on them long enough to know approximately what should be in here because the service they're the schematic not that there's really a service manual per se there's one of those it's the operations and maintenance manual but it does have the schematic in it but it does not give you any values for these capacitors it just shows it as one capacitor and then it has a the, you know number like it this is C1605 but then it has an asterisk and if you look on the legend there for the asterisk it just says uh Actually, what does it say? Something... Uh, and this this is actually the owner's manual. Came with the radio. Uh, yeah, selected values. So, you know, right there and right there, you can see it just has a little asterisk. It does not give you a value for the capacitor. You know, like this one here, you can see it's a, you know, 300 picofarad. Yeah, there's no value. It's just an asterisk. It says selected value. So, basically, it's picked at the factory when these radios were being built they'd figure out what capacitors they needed to come up with, what combination to come up to get it the radio in alignment. But, uh, yeah, like I say, that's the best way to do it, the easiest way to do it, and the correct way if you want to change the frequency, uh, you know, where these two bands would operate. Don't tinker with the coils. You go tinkering with the... Now, it will work. Don't get me wrong. You can, you can play with these coils and shift your band... The problem is, if you do it with this, these inductors right here, later on down the road, if you or some, you know, the next person that gets this thing wants to put it back in to a factory configuration, they're going to have to either rewind that coil down there or, you know, take this coil form out and rewind it and start from scratch. Where if you just change the capacitor values, you don't even have to pull this board out. You can just get down in here with your soldering iron, heat up those, because they're a little uh, funnel, what they some companies would call funnelettes. So the circuit traces are on the bottom side of this board, but there's actually a crimped pass-through for these these four holes where these trimmer caps go. So all you so there's solder on the top side here. So you can get your soldering iron down in there, melt the solder, pull up all the all the you know leads going down through on the one side, and then do the same thing on this side. And you can get them out, clean the solder out of the hole, and then shove new capacitors down in the hole. But you yeah you don't even have to take this little board out right here. Um, so, in any case, I got uh, the proper combination there. I think it worked out in this one. And that's going to vary from radio to radio. Honestly, you know, the value I tell you here is could be different than, you know, the next three radios, you know, this model that might hit my bench. 
But in this one, I think it was a like 10 pico fare that I came up with to get the CB channel back on CB. Um, like I said, I think I got an 8 and two 1 pico farads in there. Now, anytime you change any of these capacitors, be really, really, really careful. Then make sure that you're using NPO rated capacitors. Uh, the reason you want to use NPO capacitors is because if you go sticking a non-temperature compensated capacitor in here, or one that is not stable over you know a wide temperature range, people complain about these things. Some people, I don't. It's just kind of part of the fun of using a tube radio is occasionally having to turn turn the dial to stay tuned in, especially when on sideband. But tube type radios, you know, crystal synthesized ones tend to drift. It's just a fact of life. The radios heat up. You know, all of this is going to expand down here. All these parts in this big, your large tuning capacitor right here. The plates, you know, sh parts are going to shift and whatnot. Even, even just some of these leads in here, as it changes, the leads are going to get closer or farther apart, just a tiny bit th to each other. You, know, these trimmer capacitors, they're going to the same thing. They're metal. They're going to expand and contract. Changes the frequency a little bit. Well, trust me, if you don't stick, if you know, if you don't like just that little bit of frequency drift, you get a out of one of these things from the factory, go sticking a uh, a capacitor that's not rated, <laughs> you know, it's like a non-NPO rated capacitor in here, you're really going to experience uh, frequency drift then. Uh, the other thing, once I got that done, uh, fired it up, and I could actually, you know, hear some conversations on the CB band, oh my lord, were they ever muffled, um, they're still not actually that good, uh, the audio on this. I don't think it's so much uh, parts bad, it's just the alignment is so horribly out on this. I could see where everything has been adjusted in this. Um, try and get back down here to where there's all the skip. And yeah, the dial is off because, like I say, I haven't adjusted anything. Actually, currently, the dial range is expanded. So if I set, you know, go up here, transmit on you know, either band, well, actually this band especially, but if you check the transmitter receive frequency right here and, and set your dial set so it's correct and then go to the, you know, screw the whole way down to the other end of the band, yeah, this is way off. This is like channel 6, like right here. And Matter of fact, I think that I think that is channel six right there. You can see where it like in between one and channel one and two. That's because the the scales kind of expanded out because it's out of alignment. Um, but that wasn't the pro that's not the the big problem. The the other thing is you have to remember uh, all of your signals in these radios go through this filter right here. So if the frequencies get shifted, and there's adjustments in here for that, if they get shifted, it's going to pinch your audio or it's going to get too noisy. It, you can shift the pass band, basically. And yeah, that just completely destroys the, the, the receive audio on these. And it's, yeah, it was way off. I just, you know, just really quick, you know, screwdriver, uh, got it back to where I could actually understand what people were saying. But uh, other work that has previously been done to this, I think uh, the owner said that the person he got this off of did mention that the power supply capacitors had been replaced and the speaker has been replaced. So yes, this is a new new speaker. And uh, if you've ever seen one of these, when I've worked on them before, on the bottom side there's a circuit board about the same you know square size as this transformer on the bottom side. It has four large uh, axial lead electrolytic capacitors. Those four have already been replaced, but the can cap still original, and all of the rest of the axial lead capacitors on the bottom, they're still all original. So some work's been done to it. Um, so, you know, those capacitors have already been replaced. There's absolutely no need to need to replace them. They're perfectly fine. They're good either Rifa or Nichikan capacitors, you know, either made in Germany or Japan. Good high, good high quality caps. So, yeah, definitely no need to change those. Um, I'm... Customer said he didn't want to dump a boatload of money into this. He was basically, get it, see what you think of it. Is it worth worth fixing up? Well, my opinion, absolutely. Uh, it's actually in extremely good condition. The faceplate is really nice on this. Kind of hard to tell, I guess, with the lighting a little bit. 
uh, a flashlight there. But yeah, you can see it's not all beat up. A few little tiny marks on it, but yeah, overall it looks really nice. Uh, it has not been a butcher job, <laughs> you know. Uh, like I say, someone at least knew what they were doing had changed changed the frequency coverage for the CV band on this um, and done it the right way. So that, like I say, that was easy to put back. So yeah, the only, honestly, the only thing this needs now, you know, of course, the tubes need to be tested, but obviously they work. <laughs> there are no dead tubes or extremely weak tubes in this because it does receive fine and it trans it's got transmits at full power. So that's really good because that means the final tube in this is still good, which those things are getting really expensive nowadays. Um, so yeah, I just need to test the tubes, make sure there's no, none of them that are you know marginal. Or maybe have a, a short, because a lot of times a short uh, will show up on a tube tester, but when you stick the tube in the radio, it'll be fine. You know, the tube tester can check for shorts. Actually, you're checking, checking the resistance or how much there is of that short. Is it a dead short? So, yeah, a lot of times you can catch a short on a tube tester before it actually shorts out in the equipment, like, you know, like in this radio here, and might actually cause damage, especially, you know, to the transformer. Um, but, yeah, I need to test the tubes. Replace a couple caps. That's really all I'm going to recommend to him and do an alignment. And yeah, this should be a good good working radio. Uh, these things are pretty much built like a tank to start with. <laughs> they are, uh, you know, kind of the definition of a boat anchor radio. Um, you know, you tie a rope, <coughs> tie a rope to one of these things and toss it over a toss it over the edge of a boat, man. Yeah, it, it's a boat anchor. They're heavy. But uh, there you go. There's just a like I say, a, kind of a quick preview of what's to come and actually you know the rest of the video probably won't be that long like i say i've covered these before i just wanted to really quick show you what it looks like beforehand like i say not a lot to do a little bit of cleanup a little bit of spit and polish be a few parts to change um but yep overall good radio so i shall return okay so i've got her all completed now all i need to do is put the top and bottom covers on it uh tested all the tubes replaced the electrolytic capacitors that had not been replaced yet um like i said had fixed up the uh, vfo put it back the way it's supposed to be and uh good working radio now so didn't really need a lot of cleaning up basically just the dusting Whew, boy is that ever light bulb bright let me just pop that light bulb out of there <laughs> light bulb just completely blinds the camera um, so the uh, cam cap was replaced um, two things I did add up here which I've started to do on these when I do them is I put little protective shields over top of the uh, fuse holder and the uh, power cord because when this thing's plugged into a wall there's 120 volts right there you know right now there's 120 volts on that wire and that terminal the main one i'm worried about is that top terminal right there because that's the input from the power cord um, and same thing with the fuse holder both of those are live and it's kind of a two-part problem almost i'm concerned because there are holes in the top cover of these radios and you know anything could get down in one of those little holes because the the solid part of the cover is only like that wide in the back and then it starts it's perforated uh, you know if a paper clip or something got down in there and shorted out i'm more concerned actually about myself other techs and if the owner um would ever have the cover off of this radio um and run their hand across the top back edge because if you're flipping this thing up on its edge especially if you're working on one of these radios uh, when you're doing the alignment you're turning these radios up and down because there's calibration points on the underside of the radio and yes you could turn it off unplug it flip it up plug it back in turn it on but that adds a lot of time it's just easier just to flip it up you know, stand it up and back down while it's turned on and still plugged in um, this kind of prevents myself or anyone else from accidentally touching one of those you know so you don't get electrocuted i just use a insulation board um you can get this gc electronics still matter of fact where's my roll at uh, right there actually um, you know, fibroid fish paper uh where is the nte part number yeah 560 they've been making it for decades but yeah just cut out a little piece of that bend it up just 
two dots of glue on the back back panel there. It's still flexible. It makes it easy to get in here to service if you ever need to get into any of the wiring. Um, like I say, just just looking out for myself and other people. Uh, other thing I did do up here was also replace the uh, safety caps across the main power line here. So both of those got replaced, and those got changed from just non-rated, uh, you know, ceramic caps to uh, proper safety-rated caps. Um, it's just, yeah, I'd let you listen to something on air, but there's absolutely nothing but static right now. I think it's so cold <laughs> outside at the moment that uh, um, the airwaves have fro or the <laughs> the radio waves have frozen. It's so cold outside. <laughs> of course, they haven't. But just saying that joking, like, who is it ever cold out there? Um, so there's the underside. Now, like I say, I did not have to replace any of the ones on the uh, daughter board here, uh, the rectifier or filter board. These four had been replaced before. There's nothing wrong with those. Those are fairly new caps, but all the other ele electrolytics had to be replaced in here. And there's, there's not a huge amount, but there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then these two, uh, originally were not on the bottom side of the radio. Original, well, actually, one of these was. I think it was this one. This one and this one were not originally on, yeah, these two right here. So, all of the other ones you see on the bottom were original to the bottom. This one and this one were not originally on the bottom. These two were originally in the, the original electrolytic can capacitor on top. Uh, that was a four-section cap. That's been replaced with a two-section cap, or a dual-section dual capacitor. Uh, and those, that's the higher uh, value sections. I just moved the other two values because... They're fairly small values, so, you know, physically the capacitors are smaller. They were easy, easy to just pop on the underside here. Um, other than that, you can kind of obvious which resistors were replaced. You know, all the high wattage resistors were changed. Other than that, like I say, it's a good working radio. Um, receives and transmits fine. Um, now, if you ever do do one of these, uh, the can caps in these are a little... <laughs> How should we say? They're fun to do. It's a bird nest because there are a lot of connections to some of the terminals on those caps. Like this one here has got, you know, the resistor, the capacitor, this choke. There's some wires that go to it. It gets rather tight down in here. Um, finding somewhere to place both of these capacitors it can also be a little bit challenging. Because um, like I say, these were originally in the multi-section ca can cap located on the top originally. Um, this one's fairly easy to do. You can just, uh, the wire that originally went to it, actually there were two wires that originally went to that section of the can cap. Um, what you can do is, is cut, one of them actually comes from this terminal strip where the positive is attached. All you do is cut that wire off. You can now attach the can cap to that point and then just run the other wire over here. Um, this one here, there's, there's really nowhere because the connection points for this cap, as you can see, there's a resistor right here, and then there's some wires that come in. But yeah, this resistor, and you don't want to go increasing the length of this connection right here really too much. So you kind of want to try to keep this one in the, the general vicinity of where it's meant to be, right here. Uh, so what I'd, I'll do, I mean, you may have seen this on some of the other ones, I don't just don't think I've ever mentioned it is, what I'll do is, is add a terminal strip. So there's, uh, when I installed the uh, can cap, you know, this one had to get moved to the bottom. There's a screw right here. You can just, for this terminal, it's holding this terminal strip that's already down here. The problem is there's no empty terminals on it. So I need to add a terminal strip. So I just take a, actually that was a two terminal terminal strip. One of them was a ground tab. I cut the ground tab off and then I just use the other one, kind of set it down in here at an angle. It's safely away from everything, and then I can attach those two wires to it. The original resistor is still long enough to get to it, and then I can just install that electrolytic capacitor now on the bottom side and tie into the ground over here. Um, you know, and that, I don't have to worry about running long wires to get to it. But, uh, yeah, other than that, like I say, it's a uh, good working radio now. Uh, didn't really need uh, anything in the way of diagnostics other than just figuring out what uh, someone had done to the uh, inside the VFO can when they converted this radio to a strictly 10-meter uh, radio. 
And like I say, that was just a matter of coming up with the proper uh, actually, I still had them laying here on the bench. You know, I took out the ceramic caps that they had across the trimmer, the uh, trimmer capacitor in here, and just came up with the proper combination to put it back where it should be, as you know, as as it left the factory, basically. Um, so there you go, uh, Siltronics 1011D. You know, like I say, the only thing I got left to do now is pop the top and bottom covers on it. Just a quick wipe down on the faceplate because it's it's nice and clean. I don't even really need to take the knobs off to clean it up. The knob, a lot of times, you can, of course, you get a lot of finger schmutz all over the all over the knobs. But yeah, they just need a quick wipe down. I don't even need to take those out and stick them in the ultrasonic cleaner because they're all really already really nice. Uh, the one thing with anything basically Siltronics, uh, be it be it their standalone V their VFOs or radios like this, um, I really do like their tuning dials here because it's two speed. So you know this would be for your fine tune. And you can see how fast the outer knob turns when you grab the rear aluminum ring. That's your basically high speed. Uh, so reduction drive. The only problem with that is over the decades, the grease that lubricates those bearings gets to be hard as a rock. <laughs> Much less as this. You know, this is extremely hard to turn, but it also makes this one hard to turn. You actually have to grab it. Where if you look at it now, I can just flick it. And, you know, you can see how easily it turns. Just a little bit of lubrication. That's all you ever really need to do to that. Just add a couple drops of good good oil to the bearings. Now, what you, what you want to do is is set screw there, take the knob off. The aluminum knob here has two screws that go in. Take those two screws out. You can take that off. You can get down to the shaft, put a couple drops of oil, and then you can also come in from the back side in behind the dial here and get a few drops of oil down in there. Just work it back and forth a couple times, and in no time at all, you'll have uh, have that thing freed up. You know, and like I said, I really like that because you, you can just lay your finger on there. You know, it's a shame they don't have a hole in there or a knob, but uh, yeah, you just like I say, you can just tune it like that. Um, again, there's a couple other points to you know actually lubricate on these. There's you know bearing there. Uh, there's no actual ball bearing on this one, um, just because of the it, it's just the shaft just goes through so it's basically a bushing but same thing just add a drop or two of oil there same thing to those just rotate the controls around a couple times they're just you know air variable capacitors back there but uh, just give them a few spins that'll help to you know break up any gunk that's dried in there over the decade you really don't need to take it apart and completely clean them out just a few drops of oil, I'm telling you, they'll, you'll have things running you know, just as smooth as this thing is. You know, it was really stiff before. That's really all it takes. And then, of course, you have the pre-selector. Down here as well. It's also a multi-section air variable capacitor. Um, yeah, this one's a... No matter how much oil you add to this one, this one's going to be a little tight just because it has so many you know, bearing points in here. Uh, but you know, if it is extremely tight, yeah, a couple drops of oil will free that up. But yeah, expect, you know, these things should have some tension to them. You don't want these to be easy to change like your VFO here. These should have some, you know, some rotational or require some rotational torque, I guess you could say, to actually turn them. Um, only other thing you really ever want to do to these is, uh, and make sure the unit's off, the unit's unplugged, and the capacitors are discharged before you do it. But because this does not use a sealed uh, relay, the contacts, and just from age, the contacts can oxidize. Just take a piece of paper, you know, it's real simple. Just grab a piece of paper, take your scissors, cut off a little strip, you know, about that wide. For the contacts on top, just push down on the contacts, stick your piece of paper in there. Now, I'll usually put a little bit of deoxid uh, cleaner on there, but just run that paper back and forth through there. And then same thing on the bottom contacts. Slide your little strip of paper in there, and then hold down on the contact strip, and then again, pull the paper back and forth through there. And, you know, paper has, is actually fairly abrasive. Um, you know, I can remember as a kid back in the old days using a dollar, you know, remembering my father on the, the thermostat for the furnace, taking it, you know, once a year in the winter would come, uh, taking out a dollar bill and cleaning the contacts in our thermostat for our old floor furnace when I was a little kid. You know, same thing here. Relay contacts, piece of paper has all the abrasion that you need. You don't want to use any type of actual abrasive 
you know, files like contact cleaners, because uh, those things are metallically abrasive and you'll take the coat, the plating off of the contacts. All you need, piece of paper, a little bit of deoxid will help to, you know, clean it off even better. But, uh, yeah, like I said, just because they're open, they're susceptible to getting dirt and gunk in there. So, you know, they can f foul up a lot faster than a sealed relay. But uh, yeah, other than that, that's that's pretty much all this thing needed. So uh, there you go, 1011D, ready to be put back into service.